Okay, um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Seamus, who really doesn't need uh, much of an introduction from me. Um, and um, I suppose just I'll say a little bit in terms of, I mean, obviously Seamus uh, used to work here in the library. He's a, a, an author who has written many books, um, and particularly uh, in Irish. Um, he's, um, he's also, in terms of uh, being a television presenter, uh, he works uh, with a lot of the schools locally. He's been uh, a resident uh, creative writer in various universities. And we're obviously indebted to him uh, for the work that he does in terms of accumulating various material on the history of Fermanagh. Um, now, Seamus and I, obviously I'm aware of, and I don't know if Seamus, have you got any copies of your book uh, on the, the newspapers yeah. in the library, but you know, I really recommend that you get hold of that. It's a, it's a, a lovely little book uh, in terms of uh, newspapers in the 19th century. It's a little gold mine of information. And it was really through that that we had a conversation, um, I suppose, about the idea of, of using newspapers. Uh, and, I mean, newspapers are a great source of information for family history. I mean, the key thing, obviously, you need are dates. Uh, I know, for example, that Maliki there, um, who you know you will often see in the library here next to the microfilm, has used uh, you know newspapers a lot when he's been researching those early uh, Fermanagh uh, and Enniskillen MPs. Um, so they are a great source. And I got chatting uh, with Seamus and. Um, he talked to me about a little bit of the research that he was doing. Uh, one of the um, people I was obviously familiar with in terms of uh, William Copeland Trimble, uh, but I wasn't aware of, of Joseph Gallagher. And um, these were two people who were very interested uh, in the history of Enniskillen and wrote extensively in the Impartial Reporter. And I have to say, I'm, I'm amazed today. I had you know, this young gentleman and... Uh, and um, his friend came in today, and you know, I, you know, obviously my curiosity was aroused in terms of, oh right, so you know, the, the age profile of the group has kind of lowered a little bit, <laughs> you know, and so you know, and he sort of came in and then went away, and I thought, oh dear, what's happened? Have we sort of, uh, you know, have we sort of given out the wrong message or whatever? But I was absolutely amazed when he came up and asked me if he could record the talk and reveal that he's actually a great-grandson of the Joseph Gallagher that Seamus is actually going to talk about. And unfortunately, uh, he lives in Dublin. Uh, with it, uh, His father lives in Dublin as well, and unfortunately, he can't be here today. So I'd like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to both of you for coming all the Thank way you. up from Dublin today. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, Seamus will sort of give you a, a great... Um, introduction and extensive, um, I suppose, uh, recall on the work that Joseph, Joseph Gallagher did in terms of Enniskillen. So I'm just going to hand over to Seamus now, and uh, I look forward to, to hearing, Seamus, what you've got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, Frank has put it very well into context. I was going to talk today on three themes, basically, first of all, using newspapers in general, and then talking about these two marvellous figures, Copeland Trimble and Joseph Gallagher. As Frank said, the key to the newspapers is the dates. Um, there are, we have a huge range of newspapers. In the 19th century in Fermanagh, there were up to 25 different titles established. Now, some of them didn't last very long. Others are still with us. Uh, most of you probably already know this, but I'm just, I'm just going to summarise it for you. The first newspaper in Fermanagh was the Enniskillen Chronicle and Urn Packet, which started in 1808. So in other words, we can go back over 200 years. But then again, you must realise the old newspapers back then, there were only four pages, four sides, of which maybe three and a half were national and international news. There's maybe only half a page of local news, there's a certain amount of local advertising. So you're not going to get, when you think of the, the impartial reporter nowadays, it's what, 96 pages. And it's nearly all local stuff. In the old papers, that was not the case. Similarly, when we look at the, the, the newspapers today, there's two or three pages of death notices. There are obituaries. You go back to the old papers, you might get two deaths um, and a couple of births. You know, so, and gen for the most part, these would be upper class people 
or there would be people of the merchant class who lived particularly in in a skillet. If you're talking about further out in the county, uh, less likely you're going to find something. Except perhaps maybe if someone has died in an accident or something unusual has happened to them, then you may find a poor man called McCaffrey was found dead on the side of the road. You know, and then there will be a bit of information. And it's only as the years go by that the amount of information in the in the papers increases. But that's not to say, but you shouldn't disregard them because obviously if you have a, a gravestone with a, a with, with a date on it, then that's your that's that's your, your entry point into the papers. Otherwise, you also um, if if you know the dates of particular historical events, we saw um, Julian Thornton was writing about the the Mackin fight in the impartial report of the other week. If you want to read about the Mackin fight, you know what date that happened. You can go to the local papers. You can and then follow it through to find the court cases and the execution. You know you can if you know the period that's involved. You can get, you, you will find that information in the papers, and then, as the impartial <coughs> reporter which is still with us, it started in 1825. So once you get to that point, you have two newspapers, so you can get two different reports, and there's always going to be differences. And as you go through the years, there are more and more newspapers. Some of them, are, as which as they only lasted maybe for six months or five years or whatever, but bit by bit, the volume in. Of, of, of newspapers increases, so too does the actual amount of material in the papers. And even if we're dealing with international events such as the Crimean War, you will find that the local involvement is mentioned. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of the local papers. They will report back that a certain officer who is from Enniskillen has been wounded or whatever. Somebody has come home. Somebody has written home. And then, as we go on through into the 1860s, the 1870s, we start getting more and more information from people who have emigrated. You know, in the, during the famine period, the post-famine period, people who have got themselves established in Australia, in America, Canada, they start writing back. We also find, again, death notices. And, of course, what you must remember, if you're looking for those death notices in that period, is the amount of time it took for the information to get back home. So if you have an ancestor who died in Australia in March 1860, well you don't look in the paper for March 1860, start about July and you might find it, you know? The same with people in India, in South Africa. The time distance is there. But as we move through the 19th century, the time distance becomes less and less. And then, I suppose around the, the 1880s, the 1890s, and into the 20th century, something wonderful happens. The local papers take on, I suppose, almost the role that the, the, the website does nowadays, except, of course, in a much slower time frame. But people start writing from America, from Australia, asking about people who are in, in st still living in Fermanagh, sending in their, their memories of boyhood in Enniskillen. And then, lo and behold, the papers are, go out all over the world and somebody else writes back from some other part of the world who is in the same class with them. And this sort of dialogue builds up. And then somebody else adds a bit. Or somebody writes in with a query. And it's, a discussion starts. And it's just like the way the websites go nowadays, except that obviously it's a much slower, much more gradual process. And this goes right on through into the up into the 1920s, the 1930s. And this is where Copeland Trimble comes in, first of all. The Trimbles, of course, of Enniskillen, uh, the first William Trimble, uh, he came from Pomeroy. He was one of the two founders of the Impartial Reporter in 1825. If you want information about the Trimble family, um, the third generation, Egbert Trimble, published uh, a history of the Trimble family of Enniskillen. It has all the family trees. It has all the information, births, marriages, and death. It was the first. Uh, William Trimble was married twice, and he had 25 children. Uh, so it's not surprising. It's a big, thick book. Um, the, sec the second, and then William Copeland Trimble, his son, the man I'm talking about here particularly, again, he also was married twice. I think he had nine children. So there's all sorts of connections there. And as we know, it's only a couple of years 
uh, ago that the, the connection of the Trimble family with, with, with the paper was finally severed. But Copeland Trimble, of the second generation, was a man who was passionate about two things. He was passionate about the military, the military history, the history of the regiments that are associated with the town. But he was also as passionate about the history of the town itself. And he wrote about the old families. Um, <coughs> and any time somebody died that belonged, that was maybe, maybe one of the Friths or one of the Gambles or one of the Quintons, he would write about them. And he'd say, oh, they were connected to this, to the Morrisons of Darling Street, and they were connected to these people. And, of course, it was a great way to fill the newspaper, because oftentimes there wasn't an awful lot of news. But this dialogue, this discussion, took place. And he could, he could draw on his knowledge. Um, Trimble, obviously, was part of the establishment. He lived on the main street. They lived at East Bridge Street. So he's writing, for the most part, about the well-to-do families, the merchant class, the people he was at school with in Portora. And so, again, Portora is another one of his passions. Any time that somebody from Portora has done well or has, you know, has been made a knight or has been, you know, achieved something, it goes into the paper. And then, again, as I say, people who are at school with that person will write in and say, oh, I remember. And one of the most interesting people... Uh, that I have found with this is, of course, as I said, the difficulty of these papers, you have to read through them. It takes time, but you follow the sequence, you build up the information. In East Bridge Street, almost directly opposite to the impartial reporter, there lived a family called Hurls. Now, the Hurls was a, he made cutthroat razors, the original of Mr. Hurls, Richard, Richard Hurls. And they lived in the house that's now Michael Holmes um, Opticians, the, the house that the Campbell farm family had the barber shop in for years. And they were in constant uh, connection with, with their near neighbours, the Trimbles. At one stage there was a court case because uh, one of the, the, the Hurls boys was alleged to have stabbed Mr. Trimble's ass. That's his donkey. Um, and you won't find, funny enough, you won't find that court case in the impartial days. They hushed it up, but it is in the other papers. You know? And but one of these, one of the Hurls family, Smith Hurls, he emigrated and eventually ended up in California where he had a town called Hurl Town. Now it wasn't much of a town, it was basically his saloon, which was a dry saloon because he was a, you know, a very devout Protestant. There was no drink served in the saloon. But he would write, in the 1880s, 1890s, he started writing back to the impartial. He sent a complete list of the boys who were at school with him in Portora in 1840, about 1845. So again, it, it's an, an archive of names which predates the roll books that they have in Portora. And then various, then Trimble comments on this and says, oh, I know that this person's dead, that person has gone to such and such a place. And the number of people that emigrated, even from the upper class, the, 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 the business class, is quite surprising. It wasn't because of poverty that these people were emigrating, but they were emigrating because of the possibility. So they were heading off to America, to Australia. They were setting up businesses. They were making connections. And then when we get to about the 1920s, and this is something that, funny enough, just happened to come up on the Fermanagh Gold website uh, a few, a few in the last week or two. When Trimble, Copeland Trimble was 70, he set off on a world tour. The ostensible reason for the world tour was he was going to a journalist's convention in Sydney. But what he did was everywhere he went, he notified people in advance that he was coming. And so any Fermanagh people in that area, they got together and they met with him. Because he was a well-known figure. Of course, they were delighted to meet somebody from home. And as far as I can see, it was, it was a freebie for him. Because everywhere he went... People put him up, they drove him around, they brought him to meet other from other people, and he had a great time. But the beauty of this for us is that he wrote back everywhere he went, he wrote back to the paper telling of his adventures. And some of the articles are about, you know, the customs of the maybe the customs of the Indians in some part of America, or it could be about the the differences between hotels in New York and hotels in London. Just different, it's a travelogue. Different things that caught his eye. But every so often, and very regularly of course, what he writes about is the Fermanagh people that he met 
everybody went. So I'm going to read you a couple of items out of this just to give you a flavour of the sort of thing he was coming he was coming across. About 1920. Yeah. And um, in order, you should see what my room is like at home. It's <laughs> <laughs> probably as tidy as yours. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a serious <laughs> business. She was there, one of them as well. Yeah. <laughs> don't we all? Yeah, don't we all? So here he is, for instance, in San Francisco. I was not long in the city till I found my way to one of the establishments of Messrs. West, Elliot and Gordon, all for man and man. Mr. West is a brother of the late Henry West of Mullamain, Valdemar, you know, that's Henry, uh, uh, Harry West's family. Um, Mr. John Elliot, brother of Mr. George Elliot in Eskillen, and Mr. John Gordon, son of the late Mr. James Gordon, J.P. of Port Clydeuf, Church Hill. It is not necessary to speak of the welcome I received or of the kindness of Mr. Elliot in motoring me to the beauty spots of the region. <laughs> I was from home. That was enough to give me hospitality and attention. And Mr. John Follis Graham, formerly of Gorta Lohan, was there also, and likewise courteous in attention, and also his own brother. Um, I received a great surprise from Mr. W. Frederick Johnson, younger brother of Mr. Robert H. Johnson of Bon Boy House, called on me. He was one of the highly popular members of the old family of Bon Boy, which originally sprung from County Fermanagh. And he goes on, you know. Um, so, so that's an example of the, of, of the people he met in, in San Francisco. Uh, in Vancouver, and as he was, this really was some trip, you know. Uh, the Fermanagh people in Vancouver are as hearty, hospitable, and, and, and cheering as, are, as any to be found in the world. I expected just to see a few friends. I met many. The newspapers acquainted them of his arrival. You see, say he was sending on, he was letting people know that he was coming, so he, he had it well organised. Um, and they called on me or communicated me by other means, and soon the little Fermanagh colony was brought together in a most unexpected manner, many of them not being aware of others who hailed from the Lockhart County. And of course, this was the beauty of the thing. It brought Fermanagh people together. Um, Mr. Thomas Armstrong, formerly of Lisbelaw, and later superintendent of the goods department of the Great Northern Railway at Belfast, most kindly became my guide and mentor from day to day. Mr. Fowler, son of Mr. Fowler, whom I'd known in Derry Gonley country long ago, as one of its foremost respectable farmers, kindly motored me about, you see, once again. <laughs> And Mr. Sheridan of the Florence Court County, son-in-law of Mr. W.J. Brown, placed his motor car at my disposal. <laughs> Mr. Richmond from Trillick was here, Mr. Walmsley, and Mrs. C. W. Fowler, a granddaughter of the late Alex Abercrombie, of a town land that a Canadian cannot pronounce. For Sandy, a respectable rate collector of the Inniskillen Union, whom I knew well in the 1870s, lived at Drum Macabranagher. Yes. Not yeah. far from Florence Court. <laughs> He was one of the fine corps of officers of that period under whom the late W.H. Morrison used to have in charge, of whom one was Mr. Richard Lynch of, Lynch of Tati Nimona, Florence Court, who used to tell me of how, as a child, he saw the refugees pass his father's door from the, from the west on the landing of the French at Kalala in 1798. Thus have I got in touch with the 18th century, as I also did in Paris with one of Napoleon's men who marched to Moscow as one of the men of Bonaparte's period, and with Sergeant Nixon of Mill Street, who served in the 27th Inniskillings during the Peninsular War, and Private McCaffrey of Belfast, who had fought in the same regiment at Waterloo. How fortunate I have been in these respects. So you see, all the time he's drawing in the connections, and you know, his interest in the military history, and that all the, and see, it's not just, he, he doesn't simply just list the people's names, but he's drawing in further connections all the time, and connecting it all in, with the local history of the town. He goes on to say, Among the Inniskillen colony in Vancouver is Mrs. King's, Kingscombe, better known in Inniskillen as Miss Katie Whiteley, eldest daughter of the late Mr. Thomas Whiteley, who is still well remembered by Miss Carson of Darling Street, and a few other of the old residents who knew the Whiteley family of long ago and its branches. And Mrs. Little, I easily recognised recognize the Miss Brennan, daughter of the parish sexton, she had been for several years in Mr. James Dundas's in High Street and looks as fresh as in her girlhood. Members of the Gunning and Biggs families are here also. And I was told another Port Hora boy is one of the sons of Mr. Jones, 
but these are not all. And again, he goes on for another half page, another half column, mentioning all the people that he met in Vancouver. In Los Angeles, the great pleasure I enjoyed in Los Angeles was to be greeted by my old school fellow and classmate, John H. Quinton, the youngest son of Mr. William Quinton, wine merchant of Darling Street, who was son of the late Mr. James Quinton of Ballamore, one of the best known local men at the end of the 18th and beginning of 19th century. Jack Quinton is the chief engineer partner in an engineering firm and known as a noted tunnel engineer. He has designed and carried out under his supervision no fewer than 90 tunnels, one of which was six miles long. As I remarked to him, we owe a lot to the old school on the hill. We went over the boys of our class, several of whom have passed away, like William and Oscar Wilde, because Trimble was in the same class as Oscar Wilde, sons of Sir William Wilde, Judge Richard Martin Dane, Hazlett Betty, uh, Chief Local Engineer of the Cape Railways, etc. Charlie Cullum and others who have passed out of our knowing, like the Jeffers boys, but many still remain, like Bob Crampsey, Tom and W.R. Morrison, Loftus, uh, Loftus the Marcus of Ely, Pretty, uh, who is Lord Dunali, Bob Johnson of Bonboy, who he mentioned again, and you know, so on and so forth. It, it's not just that he meets the person, but he draws in all the other people as well. So, as I said, there's a most marvellous amount of stuff in Trimble's diary, his travels, <coughs> going, and, and all of this stuff, at least it's all fairly contained. It's, it's, it's around the, 18, the 1920, 1921 period. And that, of course, was a most terrible period in Irish history. That was the period of the, the War of Independence, the Civil War, the border. And to read the paper at that time is quite horrific because the sheer number of casualties, when we think of the 30 years troubles we had, it's like the whole thing being concertated into about two or three years. And what, the only thing is we can be very thankful that Fermanagh was probably the least affected area in the whole country. There were fatalities here, but nothing in comparison to what was going on virtually everywhere else. And Trimble, as I just happened to be away at the time. He was lucky, I suppose, in a sense that he avoided so much. So his articles, though, they stick out because they're, they're in a sharp contrast to what was going on at home. Um, it's all this interest in people and places <coughs> and everybody meets this hospitality, the warmth, the friendship, the making connections. And I say, this all chimes very much with us as what, you know, because this is what, what we are interested in as well. Now, the next thing that I said there were various people that, that would write into into the into the impartial reporter. I mentioned the Hurl Smith Hurls of California. He wrote in a couple of times, and there's some again. There's one lovely story I came across about Smith Hurls. Somebody else writing about Hurls said that when you go to his saloon, he always serves chicken. And the reason why he always served chicken was because he had a gold mine. But being an old man, he was unable to work the gold mine himself. But the chickens used to scuffle around on the ground outside and anything that glittered, of course, the chickens pecked it up and ate it. And so that the reason he served the reason he served chicken in his in his was that he would cut up on the gizzard of the chicken and there was the gold. <laughs> now of course that may well be a tall story, I'm no expert of gold mining, but it was California, it was the gold rush, and Smith Hurls did very well. He was a very successful businessman. And apparently the, the place he had was, it was like a shrine to Enniskillen. It was full of photographs and all sorts of memorabilia that people had sent over to him. Because even though he never came back to Enniskillen, he had all these connections and people who were always sending him stuff. But unfortunately, I think about 1905, the whole place went up in, in smoke. The whole place burnt down and he lost all the stuff. And, you know, it was just kind of a sad end because it, there must be lots of Fermanagh stuff out there, you know, that the that people took brought with them or had had sent out to them. But as it and it, at least he's one of the correspondents that regularly corresponded with um, with Trimble. Another person who regularly corresponded was Aidan Wakeman. Aidan Wakeman was the son of William Wakeman, the the, the drawing master of Portora, who's also known as an antiquarian, who drew pictures of Devonish, who went round and surveyed so many of the ancient monuments in the, the county. And he, he was living in New York, and he started writing articles back uh, to the paper. And these appeared in the paper, 
and then lo and behold, Joseph Allen Lowe, who was the son of uh, Henry Nathaniel Lowe, who was the, one of the early proprietors of the Fermanagh Times, the two of them discovered they were living less than an hour apart. And the two of them got together in New York and both started sending in uh, memories and reminiscences of old Inniskillen in the 1870s, the 1880s, when, when they were young. And then we come to Joseph Gallagher. Joseph Gallagher was the most important of all the people, because most of the people that started writing in stories to the impartial, most of them had only two or three or four stories to write, or sometimes they were just comment, comment, commenting on some little thing that caught, that, that sparked their, their memory their, or their imagination. Somebody, you know, if somebody died, they said, oh, I remember him, I used to be in his shop, it was a great shop for such and such. Joseph Gallagher was an exact contemporary of Copeland Trimble. Copeland Trimble, as it, was born on the main street, 18, and he, he, Copeland Trimble lived from 1851 to 1941. He lived to be 90. Joseph Gallagher was born in Cross Street in 1850, and he lived also until 1941. Which is you know, a, a strange coincidence, because Joseph Gallagher's background was completely different. His father was a coach driver. He drove the probably the mail coach to Armagh, to Dublin, and it was a, a hazardous <coughs> sort of existence. But it had, and also at the time young Joseph was growing up in the 1850s, the trains were coming, and the coach drivers started losing their jobs. The mail was coming on the train. Um, all that great network, the Bianconis, all that sort of thing, it fell away and the coach drivers, the people who looked after the horses, the saddlers, all those people began to lose their, their jobs and the times were hard. The one advantage the coach drivers had was that because most of the people who travelled on the coach were the gentry, the respectability, they were well in with, the, with Lord Inniskillen and Lady This and all the rest, and could sometimes, you know, they, they were able to deal with these people in a way that, that an ordinary working man couldn't do. And so Joseph Gallagher was given, he managed to get an apprenticeship as a printer. His brother, Jack, uh, got a commission in the Royal Engineers uh, through the, the auspices of, of Lord Cole of Florence Court. And in those days, you couldn't get a commission in the Royal Engineers unless you already were an officer in some other regiment. So it was sort of a catch-22 situation. So Cole um, enlisted him, I think, in the, the Enniskillen Yeomanry and straight away made him an officer. And once he was an officer in the Enniskillen local regiment here at Hull, in, in, in Fermanagh, he was able then to transfer to the, to the Royal Engineers and he had a successful career uh, in the Royal Engineers. Joe Gallagher, uh, the, the printer, started off as a messenger boy in the Impartial Reporter. He was the same age as Copeland Trimble, who obviously was attending Port Hora School and then going off to Wales to work on a newspaper, whereas Joe Gallagher was a, a printer. He, he served his time, started off as a messenger boy, then got a, an, a printing apprenticeship on a different paper, uh, the Fermanagh Advertiser, which was in Town Hall Street. And after serving so many years there, um, he qualified as a printer and he worked in various places around the country. We find him in the 1901 census. He is in Athlone. In the 1911 census, he's in Derry. And, uh, and, 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 in, and then in retirement, uh, he lived in Dublin. And it was only around 1921, 1922, I presume when he had retired, he came across a copy of the Impartial Reporter and he was interested in the debates and discussion about Old and Eskillen and he, start, he obviously got in touch with Copeland Trimble, his contemporary, and started writing articles for the paper under the initials J.G. Now I came across the articles probably first of all around the 1930s and from context I was trying to work out who is this J.G. You know, because, and I thought at first maybe he was one of the Gordons because he said he lived in Water Street and I knew the Gordon family had been in Water Street the, and from the 1860s right until Water Street was knocked down but gradually I, I came to realise that he was Joseph Gallagher um, from various clues and then occasionally it, it, his name is actually given in the paper because 
for instance, the son of his first marriage, Joseph Gallagher, also uh, got involved with the newspaper industry. He did a, uh, his he, be he became a journalist by doing an apprenticeship on the Impartial Reporter. He ended up working in China on a, an English language newspaper right there, and then later was part of the, the, the press corps at Westminster. So uh, it's interesting to see how the, how the, the, the family traits, how the thing worked in the family. But what I want to do specifically today is to read you some of the articles, some of, of Joseph Gallagher's articles, because between about 1920 and 1940, almost till about a year before he died, he was contributing these articles to the Impartial Reporter. I have photocopied, I think, 330 articles. And some of them, there is a certain amount of repetition, but on the whole, when you put the whole lot together, it's the most extraordinary corpus of history of Enniskillen, of, if you like, the back streets history, the ordinary working people's history of Enniskillen. Trimble was able to write about the, the well-to-do families, the, the families he was at school with, and the people who lived on, Eden, uh, on East Bridge Street. Uh, Joseph Gallagher was writing about, and we get, for those of you who don't know Enniskillen, uh, the diamond, where the town hall is, the main, the, the square in Enniskillen, the road leading down past the town hall to the river, was known as Water Lane, it's now Water Street, but he, he, he mentions so many of the different people that lived in Water Lane. The street that runs off Water Lane, parallel to the main street, is Cross Street, it's nearly all knocked down, there's only one side of it now, the side that Joe Gallagher lived on is gone, but we can work out that he lived about three doors uh, to the left of Kamal's, and um, he describes all that, they were all little low thatched cottages in those days, there was no footpath, it would have been cobbled, uh, it was dark and dingy, but most of the people who worked in those houses, who lived in those houses, they worked <coughs> from home, there were cobblers, there were uh, seamstresses, uh, various trades taking place in those houses in Cross Street. Then if you go along Cross Street for a while and head down towards where Dickie's Yard is, that was Down Street. <coughs> yeah, where the telephone exchange was. And he went to school in Down Street. There was a woman called Hannah Sarsfield, a big tall woman with red hair. And he describes going to school. And, and, the, you know, and, this was before, and then later he went to Abbey Street School. Again, another street that's gone, but just, just near here. And he describes all that. And what we can do with the different articles is put them all together and take a bit out of this one and a bit out of that one. And it virtually creates an autobiography. Which is, and it's a most extraordinary find. To find a complete story of one person's life in the 1850s, the 1860s, in an Eskillum. And his memory, when he was in his 80s, is as sharp and as clear all right, he does, sometimes he gets people's first names wrong, particularly women. And I think that's because people weren't known by their first names. Especially for a small boy, that would have been Mrs. Carson. And that would have been, you know, they would, he wouldn't have been sure of their first name. <coughs> but for instance, I guess as I was going through these articles, I was sort of amazed how far back they went. Uh, for instance, he describes uh, a famous incident that happened in the town called the Battle of the Corwaddles. A corwaddle is a type of biscuit, uh, also known as dairy slates, apparently. But there were big biscuits with, with holes in them. And there was a row between the Donegal militia, who were stationed in Fermanagh, uh, just around the time of the Crimean War. And they were mostly Catholic, and they had a row with some of the local orange men in Enniskillen. And there was a pitched battle up and down the main street of the town. And in the process, during that battle, there was a barrel of biscuits outside, um, I think it was Mr. Black's shop, and the barrel of biscuits got knocked over, and the biscuits were all scattered across the street, and that's how it's known as the Battle of the Corwaddles. And Joseph Gallagher writes about this, and he describes how when this melee started, he went into the, ch into the chapel grounds and closed the iron gates, and stood, and he saw the whole thing from within the chapel gates. And he thinks it happened about 1858 or 1859. I found it in the old papers. It actually happened in 1856. So there he was, a little six-year-old boy. You also get the sense that he had the run of the town. You know? 
We wouldn't let six-year-olds run around the town nowadays. But there he is. He was able to describe um, this event very clearly. This pitched battle here. The soldiers took off their belts and used the belts as weapons. And um, he describes all this. And as I said, when you actually find it in the local paper, it's 1856. His memories go further back than that. He talks about in 1853, as a small child, he was suffering from infantile paralysis. And he was brought to the priest. And the priest at that stage lived in what we know as the reading room, the Clinton Centre, that site. Because uh, the Catholic Church had just bought that site after Kernahans had gone bankrupt. And before there was a priest's house built in the town, the priests lived in that building. And the, the small child was brought there. And he says, I don't remember much about the, the cure, but he says he remembered running back home. And, that, and he says it was when I was two or three years old. And this was somebody in their 80s, referring right back to the early 1950s. So that's sort of the beauty and the, 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 the amazing thing about it. Are you going to publish? I, d I would love to put the whole lot together, but it's, it's such a... I'm going to read you a couple of pieces anyway, just till you get the flavour of them. Um, there was a man called William Kettle lived on the main street. He lived in the shop that's now the works. You know, it's the one next to Mercer's, right? And he was a draper, a very wealthy man. The back premises ran all the way down to Cross Street, where a large gateway, painted in a flaming red colour, led to an extensive farmyard on the opposite side of the street, also owned by Mr. Kettle. He was a prosperous man who lived at peace with his fellow men, and had earned the respect of his neighbours. Now that actually is a bit, I could throw other stuff from the paper, but again, there's nothing malicious about what Joseph Gallagher writes about. If he's telling a story, he's telling it for the sake of telling the story, and you can make what you like of it. So he's, even though I could, find, I could quote, I think, four examples I have from the papers of William uh, Kettle getting involved in fisticuffs with people. <laughs> uh, he had a row with Thomas Crook, who was the sexton of the church, who was also a little cobbler who lived down in Eden Street, or Pudding Lane, as it was known then. Um, he also had a fight with, a, with, with one of the gambles, with a Baptist gamble. Um, he also, then there was a, a, a very unsavory incident where uh, a street girl was shouting abuse at him, calling him big-bellied uh, kettle, <laughs> and calling him a bilk. And a bilk is somebody who doesn't pay for their, what they've got. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> but, but, uh, but Kettle took, he didn't take a case against the girl, he took a case against the police, there was a policeman standing, and the policeman didn't try to silence the girl, and so he took a case against the policeman for uh, dereliction of duty, <laughs> and of course then the whole sort of thing came out, but it, 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 uh, the policeman was, was, was not found guilty, but that's, I said, that's when you put the whole lot together. That's the beauty of the local papers. I mean, I have William, Trevor, William Kettle is buried out at Ahalorher, so you can get his, his, his dates. But this is putting flesh on the bones. In the course of time, Mr. Kettle gave up farming. When the farm buildings were altered into two substantial seven-roomed houses, one of which was tenanted by Charlie Char Carlton, the postman, and the other by Michael Higgins, one of the local shoemakers. My father succeeded Higgins in the occupancy of this house and was living there when the story begins. So that the Gallagher family are there in Cross Street. And this must, but we reckon, about 1855. Enniskillen was infested by beggars of all description at this period in its eventful history. How they managed to eke out an existence was not easy to discover, but they managed it somehow. Each one, too, possessed some peculiarity from which he or her became saddled with a nickname, under which... In the process of time, their real identity completely disappeared. Among the lot was an extraordinary looking character called Philip Aramadou. I'm spelling the name phonetically as it sounded upon my ear. I know not whether it be correct or otherwise, for it little seemed to be, to be known by the people as to who he was or where his name came from. There was a story current, however, that Aramadou had at one time occupied a high position in society and was a highly educated man. It was said, there was a woman in the case. <laughs> His present plight, however, no, bore no indication of either education or good standing on the social scale. Large masses of unkempt hair hung around his head, ha face and shoulders, 
which proved so stiff that even in the strong March breezes were unable to disturb a single lock. It must be like dreadlocks, yeah? Very little of his face was to be seen peering through the hairy mask that covered it. His clothing was a thing of shreds and patches, held on his shriveled body by a thread here, a cord there, or a piece of rope where pressure was greatest. The only article about Aramadou that seemed to be in a sound condition was the bag which he carried on his back. It was divided in two and was carried over each shoulder, being fastened in front by a stout rope. Into one mouth of his bag went the food or other clean articles given to him by the people, while into the other went the refuse picked from the streets. With a stout black thorn in his hand, this wretched specimen of humanity moved along, crooning a weird monotone note, stopping only to poke through the refuse heap that had not already been removed by the corporation sweeper. William Kettle, the affluent draper and retired farmer, took a strange dislike to Aramadou for some reason not generally known, but it was hinted that they had met before. On his rounds, the poor beggar man cross, passed through Cross Street every day at about the same hour, and the rich man, Kettle, made it a general practice to be at his back gate to taunt and annoy him. No reply was ever made by the poor man to the provocation given to him. He simply bowed his head closer to the ground, as if he would fain shout out the mocking as if, as if he would fain as if as if he fain would shout out the mocking sounds. And when his task of the dust heap was ended, passed along crooning his weird note, looking neither to left nor right. One day, however, Kettle became more aggressive than usual. He lifted a, a, a half a brick that lay at his feet and flung it at a ramadou. It struck him upon the crippled leg, and down he fell upon the street yelling with pain. Kettle rushed into his comfortable home, closing the gate with a bang while he roared with delight. The wanton act roused my childhood indignation, and I shouted in anger with all my might at the perpetrator. When Aramadou's e wounded pain had eased a little, he struggled to his feet, shaking himself as would a spaniel dog of the effects of a watery dip. Then, kneeling down upon the spot where he had fallen, he raised his eyes heavenward, and called for vengeance upon the head of his persecutor. His voice was loud, and it sounded far over the quiet street. The language used was so awful that no respectable paper could be asked to publish it, nor do I care to repeat it myself. Aramadou came along the next day as usual, and when he reached the spot where he had previously fallen, Kettle was absent. Here again, Philip knelt and prayed as before, in a louder tone of voice. The neighbours gathered round him. When he had finished, my mother stepped towards him and pointed out the sinfulness of his awful curse. Looking at her calmly for a few seconds, he said, Tell me, madam, what would you do if you were treated by this man as I have been for no reason? <clears throat> I'd bless those who cursed me and pray for those who persecuted me, as we are taught, she answered. You are a good woman, said the unmoved Aramadou. But there is another law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Lex talionis, he cried as he departed down the street, leaving the group of women gazing after him in wonder. It was now well advanced in the latter half of the year. The days were shortening and the cold was beginning to make itself felt. Aramadou retired to his winter quarters at Corner Grade, that's the workhouse, earlier that year as was his, than was his custom, and he was never again seen in the streets of Inniskillen. During his stay in the workhouse, he became ill and died, and his body is now resting in the limey soil of Corner Grade. About this time too, the absence of William Kettle from his usual post at the back gate in Cross Street began to be comment commented on. No cause for his disappearance was forthcoming until one day he suddenly took up position once more in his favourite place, but on this occasion supported by two crutches and in appearance but a shadow of his former self. Then it was learnt that in around the time of Aramadou's retirement to the workhouse, he had been stricken by a severe illness from which he had not fully recovered. He arose from his bed of sickness with paralysed lower limbs and enfeebled frame to live only one year more in pain and misery. Then he goes on to, to bring in the wider context. About the time William Kettle died, changed circumstances were coming for a number of families in and around Inniskillen. As the railways were being finished to the different towns, the stagecoaches were dropping off causing a great want of employment among the drivers, ostlers, saddlers, coachmakers, carriers and others, those who suffered most being the drivers. So he's talking about his own family here. My own poor mother was often so hard pushed to make ends meet, but being a woman of resource, she put cups and saucers in the window 
a sign that hers was a house of entertainment for farmers and their wives upon fair and market days, and her success was great. And if you go to Manor Hamilton, there's a street in Manor Hamilton called Teapot Lane. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. People would put a teapot in the window to show that you could come in there and have your food. The restaurant of the present day had not yet come in. Farmers' wives went themselves to the grocer or butcher and bought what they needed for their meal and then paid so much a head for sitting room and cooking. And then he goes on to describe one of the characters who used to cook <coughs> and eat in the house was a, a, Bible, sale, a, Bible, a Bible salesman, uh, William Galbraith from Derry Lynn, who worked for the Hibernian Bible Society. And he talks about, you know, he used to carry a, a knapsack of Bibles around the fair. And that old man took ill and had to be brought home to Derry Lynn, uh, but he left his bag of Bibles behind him. His wanderings were nearly at an end. After a strenuous day at Inniskillen Fair, he took ill and was conveyed home by his friends, leaving behind his old knapsack packed with Bibles. It lay upon the wide landing in the stairhead of our house, where for a long time it was unheeded. At night, strange noises began to disturb the household. The knapsack seemed to be dragged along the floor and then dashed down with a bang. In the morning, the knapsack, no matter how securely it had been fastened overnight, was found unloosened with a testament always lying open on top, each time of the Gospel according to St. John. At first it was thought that it was William Galbraith who was revisiting the scenes of his earthly labours, which he loved so much, but that was not the case, for his spirit was at rest. The knapsack and the Bibles were taken away, but the noises on the landing didn't cease, and our household was much troubled in consequence. Our curiosity as the cause of the uncanny noises on our landing was soon set at rest. One night, when returning home late from work, the figure of a man went up the stairs before me. I almost withered from fright, but made an effort to reach my room above for safety. When at the top of the stair, the form of William Kettle came into full view, minus the crutches, and clothed as he was the day that Aramadou knelt in the mud and cursed him. Down the stairs I fled, where I waited the arrival of the awakened household. The uncanny thing was afterwards seen by others, and all arrived to the same conclusion that William Kettle was expiating in the spirit what he had done in the flesh. The beggar man's curse had taken effect. The weird rappings in the lonely midnight hour had not ceased when our household sought another dwelling. So it's a lovely mixture of history and folklore and imagination and, 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 and information there, you know? Because, and what I find sort of amusing about his stuff is he's lamenting the end of the coaching days. Just as we lament the passing of the railway. You know, the railway is a big sort of sentimental thing for people of our generation. But him, it's the coaches, and, and the railway is the new evil, if you like, coming in. And he lived virtually to see the end of the railway era. But think of it, he was born in 1850 and died in 1941. Um, let's see, I have time for another piece or two. Because so there's lovely descriptive passages, particularly of the of the old town. When I was a boy, the cro houses in Cross Street were all roofed with thatch, save one or two. There were no side paths, no, nor were there even water channels. So you can imagine a back street, you know. The roadway went right up to the doors of the dwellings, especially in the lower part abutting on Down Street. The houses were of such a peculiar construction that I find it difficult to convey an intelligent idea of their appearance. Each house had two front entrance doors, a tall one leading into a tall apartment with a back door right opposite the front one and a staircase rising up to a large wide loft above, while a smaller door gave entrance to a room and a kitchen minus any upstairs accommodation or rear outlet. If we accept a small four paned window which opened upon hinges. The window of this portion of the structure seemed to have been intended for some business purpose. It was square and had larger panes than those of the bigger houses, as if the intention of the architect was that this should be the business quarter of the thoroughfare. And that's one of the things you have to realise, is that the old houses in Enniskill were completely different to anything we see now. And that very often the houses were let to two different families. And also that there's very little of the old town left. Because even... Even when we're talking about Water Street, has obviously has been has been cleared. 
But the water street that was there when Joseph Gallagher started writing was the previous water street. There were houses that were there which were cleared in the early 1860s. And then the houses that we remember were the houses that were built then. So he's able to describe the people and the houses that were there before then. So if you're looking at your Griffith valuations of the 1860s, you'll find some of the people that he mentions, but he also talks about the people who lived just there, just before that. So that's all, all very valuable. Old Cross Street was a drear and drab enough looking thoroughfare in the middle years of the 19th century with its rows of small thatched houses on one side and on the other side a, a line of nondescript back entrances belonging to the business premises on the main street. And of course this was dominated by Whiteley's or Whitley's which we would remember as Wellworth's, that big building that was there. And he, of course, that building was originally a barracks and I think about 1864 the whole thing burnt down. And it burnt for three days. And of course the people in Cross Street who were overshadowed by this massive building, they were terrified. And they stood there watching this in awe and, 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 and they, totally aghast. And he and Joe, Joseph Gallagher is one of the witnesses. He's there. He describes the thing. And he also said, as well as the factual account of the, the actual fire, there's also the folklore that goes with it. That one of the owners of the premises again met a presence on the steps when he was trying to escape and it held him back and he couldn't escape and that's how he got the, the he, he, he suffered from smoke inhalation and died some weeks later. So you know the, 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 again that the colour, the imagination uh, mixed in with the history. Um, he mentions in Cross Street one of the people he mentions is uh, an old man he, he, um, right opposite the old gateway, this is the gateway of, of the, the barracks there stood a little thatched cottage occupied by Willie Ball and his wife. He was there when I was born. I gambled about his knee when a toddling child, saw his hair grow old in the days of my youth, and left him behind when the shifting scenes of life made a change in my scene of operations. Willie was a modest old man, and no one would imagine that the grey-haired old man in his suit of corduroy, who sat by his turf fire smoking an old clay pipe, had been in one of the most glorious achievements of the British Army. He had been one of the noble band of pipers, the sound of whose pipes raised high hopes in the hearts of the sufferers behind the slender defences of Lucknow. That was in, in India, during the, the, the Indian campaign. Willie Ball had seen much soldiering at a time when pay was small, work hard and years of service long, some of which was done with his regiment in Enniskillen. Like most ex-servicemen, he would spin a good yarn. And he used to tell with much, much gusto of how the dead house in the castle barracks got the reputation of being haunted. And he goes on to tell of how a drunken soldier was found and they thought he was dead. And they put him in the, the dead house as the mortuary. But that's the word we still use in the town, even for up at the hospital. People talk about the dead house. The mortuary. And in the middle of the night, of course, the guy woke up and he was, oh, startled the life out of the sentries. And, that, and that's how the story of the ghost down at the castle uh, developed, you know. And, is that um, the Willie Ball that was the pharmacist? No, I don't think this is any connection at all, to be honest. Postmaster. There was a Willie Ball postmaster as well. Um, but I often heard old Willie Ball speak of the execution of Rutledge, McManus, Wilson and Kerr, and of other people in Inniskillen whom fate had brought into prominence in the history of the town. John Rutledge was a great orange man who was tried before Baron McClelland for shooting at Captain Maguire. Um, he was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged on the 23rd of April 1829. The sentence aroused the utmost indignation among the Protestant people and even amongst the great majority of Catholic population the severity of the sentence was condemned. It was generally believed that the executive was anxious to crush orange feeling in the district and to mollify Catholic distrust. But thinking Catholics believed that justice could be rendered unto them without the sacrifice of a human life on a prim, flimsy pretext. They did not want liberty at such a price, and therefore Rutledge's execution was severely criticised on all sides. Um, Willie Ball claimed to have known Rutledge well when he was a young man, and often referred to his presence in Temple Churchyard at the burial. The gathering multitude that surged around that mound of earth as the orange men filed in round the closed-in closed grave, was always fresh in his memory. Willie had been an orange man in his early days, but having married a Catholic wife, had become nothing in a religious sense, the usual outcome of mixed marriages on either side. Old Mary Ball, who had been a nurse among our folk when times were good, 
and who did not desert her post when things changed for the worst, used to tell many stories about Princess Dew, the Fermanagh Highwayman. Mary was born away back in the closing years of the 18th century, and as well as memory serves me, she used to speak of her father or some close relation having been present at the hanging of Princess Dew on Gallows Green at a time when Inniskillen was little better than a village of thatched cottages. So again, you see that the connection is going right back. His memory is so vivid, so clear, all the people he meets, all the different stories, all coming together. And I say, what you can do with the stories is gradually, say, put them in chronological order and fill in all the different people that lived in the houses down. He, he mentions the different houses in Water Street. There was a, an Irvine lived in one of them who had been on the Bellerophon, which was a, a, a Royal Navy ship to which Napoleon was brought after he was captured. And this guy from Inniskillen was there and was able to tell the story of seeing Napoleon on the ship. And I think the, um, I can't remember the exact, but he, 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 he goes into quite a lot of detail about, about being on the ship with Napoleon. And he also tells the story about uh, Irvine, um, or maybe it was Porter, there was two of them on that, that lived side by side. But his, the ship was in Plymouth at one stage, and uh, he was press gang. You know, the way that they used to grab people off the street. But he was lucky enough that he was press ganged onto his own ship. <laughs> <laughs> because they were trying to I'm already in the Royal Navy. I'm already a sailor. Leave me alone. And they wouldn't leave him, of course. But by good luck, he was press ganged onto his own ship. And didn't have to sort of go through the whole, the whole thing again. Um, and then, as I always, the humorous little detail. Uh, the piece about the Battle of the Cor Waddles. He finishes it off with this. Um, he, describing the... You know, the, 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 the regiment and some of the officers involved. Uh, Dr. Walsh was the regimental doctor of the Fermanagh, this is then the Fermanagh militia. Uh, and when on parade he presented so picturesque a figure in his cocked hat and feathers as he sat on his charger with the ease of a riding master that he was reputed to be the best dressed doctor in the service. Lady Dr. Walsh sported from time to time all the absurd fashions which la ladies affected during the reign of Queen Victoria. But Lady Welsh, Walsh excelled in the extent of her Grecian bend. This was an arrangement called a bustle, shaped like a pillow, which ladies of the time wore tied across their hips behind, giving them the appearance of a bend forward. It was a ridiculous idea and spoiled the figure of a most perfect woman. Mrs. Walsh had a small Persian kitten which always followed her on parade through the street. One day the kitten disappeared. The poor lady was much distressed. It could be found nowhere until at last a lady friend discovered it snugly asleep among the folds of the bustle across her back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so guys, you know, the, the detail, the, you know, the, the, it brings the, I mean, we're, we're familiar with a lot of these names, but it brings these people to life. We can picture them. And um, the description of the diamond, the old town. I've often stood upon the diamond when not a sound was to be heard, save the echo of all's well, from the watchful sentinels high up on the redoubt or in the barracks below, or the tweet tweet of the of the curlew herald, heralding a coming shower. How long is it since we've heard a curlew in Inniskillen? The glamour of the hour was heightened ever and anon by the oyster man's appealing tones as they rose up in mournful cadence from the hollow below and faded away behind the cupola capped tower of the old town hall, which cast the venerable shades of a long existence around that place of memory. This was his hour for business. The pubs were about emptying themselves of their patrons, many of whom were just in the, in the humour for, for an al fresco supper, which usually came off at the foot of some lamppost. Before the clock was lighted in the clerk's tower, the ticking heard high up in the darkness had a mysterious ring to it and seemed to make the silence more profound. So you can imagine that, of course, the whole town in virtual darkness and the clock up on the church here ticking. And you could hear that again. We can't. Hear, it's of course it's electric yeah. now, but in the old days they could hear the tick. They couldn't see the clock, but they could hear it. The diamond of Inniskillen at this period in its history was a quaint, picturesque-looking spot, resembling an old Flemish market, as one is seen as as one sees it painted by old Dutch artists, more than it did the centre of a town aspiring to attain first-class provincial position. And. Um, he, he, he described, across the street at the head of Puddin Lane, 
Shining in the noonday sun, Mrs. Annan's neat whitewashed business premises looked to advantage as they nestled snugly in the corner of John Martin's house, forming the cosy angle on the east side of the Diamond Square, when we think of the monstrosity that's there now, and looking indeed a pretty picture of Auld Lang Syne. In the centre of the square stood the village pump, around which the Ruths and Rebecca's of Pudding Lane gathered in the morning sun to babble about their dreams and discuss their lovers' quarrels. Or mayhap in the hope that some amorous Isaac or Jacob might wander hither <laughs> to meet his fate. It's like, that's lo it's lovely, it's poetic, for a fellow who had only basic education, you know, uh, that must have left school at 10 or 11, uh, to be able to write stuff like that. Eden Street, of course, they, Eden Street is the street that leads off the diamond down towards the, the bus station. Eden Street was unknown. It was called Pudding Lane, from the quantity of entrails of animals butchered in the shambles at the foot of the lane, which were deposited in one of the canals, then in existence to enable cops to discharge their cargoes of turf or sand at a convenient spot. So you must remember, the water came right into the bottom of Eden, Eden Street, and that the water was rancid, it was stinking, it was full of animal entrails. But the cots, the low bottom boats, would come in bringing, bringing the supplies of turf for the town to the bottom of it. So, you know, I said, it's all just so vivid. Um, Pudding Lane was the most interesting corner in all of old Inniskillen. Judging by its story of the past, the variety and number of its inhabitants, their different occupation, and the harmony that prevailed among so many people of differing, differing in race and creed. Its buildings, too, were a crude mixture of the Elizabethan, Georgian, and Victorian styles of architecture, that they made such a homely blend of the ancient and modern that Puddin Laneians affectionately referred to it as dear old Puddin Lane. And then he goes on to, the, he talks about the Annan family next door. There was Kitty Spratt, who again had one of these sort of restaurant places. Um, and so had the McGahys, which talks about the McGahys. The old town hall was but a thing of shreds and patches that had come into being through a process of evolution at diverse periods out of an ancient wide-eyed market house, a thing of wide arches and iron gates where wet men and women assembled at stated times to dispose their wares. The eye of the market house was the euphonious title by, by which the entrance to the town hall used to be known by old Inniskilleners. And here on cold winter's morning, the labouring men took their stations in quest for work. So the men had to queue up and hope to be employed. So they stood there huddled inside the archway of the town hall. It also afforded shelter to the men who attended the stage coaches as they awaited their arrival at the Imperial Hotel in days gone by. By some it used to be referred to as the local slave market, for here men of the labouring classes used to assemble in the early hours of the morning, carrying all classes of working implements to await engagement of employers having work to do. It was quite a picturesque scene on a bright summer morning to see the men clad in all sorts of garments, gathering in groups in the diamond or around the old hall, or if it was wet, standing in knots and taking shelter in the eye under the careful guardianship of George Connor, who moved about in his blue and scarlet uniform, lending colour to the scene. And he goes on to describe then a piece about George Connor looking after the town hall and all the different things that went on in the town hall. There was a Masonic meeting room, there was a library, um, all sorts of different things going on in different rooms and he describes the stone steps. You can really picture what the old town hall was like, so it, it's wonderful for that. I've probably gone on early enough, have I, Frank? Um, it's only to give you a flavour of the, of Joseph Gallagher's wonderful uh, collection of, of stories and stuff connected within his skin. And I say, when he put his and Trimble's stuff together, when Trimble went to Australia, a man of about 80 years of age came up to meet him and said he was Thomas Kettle. He was son of William Kettle. And because he was older than Trimble, he had, he had emigrated before Trimble had grown up. Trimble never knew him. And he was sort of dubious. He said, are you sure? And he, said, and he was able to tell Trimble the name of Trimble's dog. <laughs> you know, so, so the, again, the memories of home coming back, connecting, you know. And so... Uh, and then later on in the 1930s, somebody else from Australia writes to say that they've just met this Thomas Kettle, that he's 94 years of age, and he's, he's still living in Australia. He's got, he married, but he had no family. And that's probably the last we see of that particular branch of the Kettle family. But it's just extraordinary, you know, that the things keep tying in, connecting, and reconnecting. 
I'd like to finish by thanking uh, Robert, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, for coming up to thank you. to really to, uh, as a, a great bonus to 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 to, to make, make the living connection with the Gallagher family. Uh, the internet is a marvelous thing. As we uh, as you can find the, the family on the the 1901 and 1911 census, and then I discovered I dis I found out that the youngest member of Joe Gallagher's family, Colin Gallagher, became a TD, a member of the. Uh, a Fianna Fáil member of Parliament in uh, Dublin in the 1950s. That'd be your grandfather, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to see how that you know from very humble beginnings in Cross Street, and just you know, each generation makes its own of the world. And uh, would you like to say a little bit about the family yourself? Or um, no. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's, you're, you're very welcome. Like, yeah. we're, we're delighted to. Yeah. To, to, to see you, as I say, it's great to make the connection. I suppose though, the only interesting thing is about my, my grandfather is who I know the most about, but um, he was he was actually a boxing referee. Mm -hmm. um, I think he refereed in some Olympics mm -hmm. uh, before he became a TD. Yeah. Uh, and he was, he, he was he had a, quite a few careers. He was a boxer and a, a boxing referee as well. So uh, he got into the politics through the boxing, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but, uh, I never knew anything about the, the anyone beyond that. Sure, either, so. yes. So, so, so I mean, so, yeah. it's a wonderful thing for the family yeah. now to have this treasure trove yeah. of stuff. Yeah, you have to publish it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because, yeah. because you know, I, you know, most of us were lucky if we get our great grandfather's name and address, you know, name and birth, marriage, and death. But I said that the Joseph Gallagher stuff describes his ho his home life, his school, uh, his apprenticeship on the local papers. Paints a word picture. It really paints a word of the whole street, the old streets that are long gone. Uh, I can remember Cross Street, right, where uh, your man lived that, that worked for Tommy Nelson that threw the the mural in the Regal Cinema, and Andy, what's the his name was? Davis. He was Andy Davis. Davis. Yes. Andy Davis was electrocuted out at Castle Archdale when the CEO's wife demanded that the electric be switched on again. But. Uh, where Andy Davis lived, you went down two steps to get to the front of the door right. that opened on yes. Cross Street. And I used to walk along Cross Street every day from 1950 to 1955.